right. Hey, good morning, everyone. It's great to be together. Uh, my name is Rob, one of the pastors here. It's great to see all of you. I have been, uh, list- I actually just finished listening to the incredible new memoir by Viola Davis called Finding Me. Anyone else uh, read that book or listen to it? Come on. It's like Oprah's book list, you guys. You're so unage- educated. Okay. Um, <laughs> But it was incredible. I heard a lot about it, and uh, so I listened to it. She read it um, through Audible, and I was just blown away. Um, She had a horrific childhood. I mean, it made my childhood look like I grew up in Disneyland or something like that. She grew up very, very poor. Um, um, She grew up on the East Coast, primarily in a white, small town. Um, She was constantly, she writes all about this, constantly hungry, uh, lived in just awful conditions. She talks about her battles even with the rats in her little, what you would maybe call an apartment. Um, Probably the hardest part about her childhood was, um, along with her brothers and sisters, all the trauma that came from an abusive father who also beat her mother almost nightly. She writes all about that. But what I found so interesting was uh, just how she subscribed making it and breaking into Hollywood. You know, like, um, by the way, if you don't know Viola Davis, she did like the help, you know, help that, you know, um, she's been in fences with Denzel. Ooh, I love Denzel. Um, but before reading her memoir, I just thought, you know, she went to Juilliard. I knew that. And she just got in like everyone else. But she, she talked about how it was such a long, hard and painful journey. She writes that because she was older, because she was not only a black woman, but she says because she was a dark-skinned black woman, she found it really difficult to get any work in Hollywood. Almost always, and and early on, she was cast as the drug-addicted mother. Um, She was never had a leading role for a long time. And so she struggled throughout her childhood. She struggled throughout her life with this, with wondering, man, like, where do I belong? Where do I fit in? And again, I don't want to give away any more of the book because I think you should read it. It was deeply moving and powerful. And oh, by the way, I, I was surprised by this. She clearly came to faith in Jesus, was baptized at her church, married this godly man. And that's why I was so excited to go see, you know, The Woman King, which just came out, which is a great movie too. But as I cried throughout that book, I know you're surprised at that. Um, as I listened to it, man, I just found myself deeply relating to Viola Davis. Like, I grew up poor like her, but I was a white kid in a mostly Hispanic and black neighborhood. So I didn't really fit in with a lot of the kids I grew up with. Then I came to faith in Christ, and, but I came to faith at this large evangelical church on the white side of town called Castro Valley, um, kind of an upper middle class. And uh, the church was awesome. It was loving. It was great. It was biblical, all that. But most of the kids in our youth group went to a private Christian high school, right? Um, they didn't really talk like me or look like me. And, and you know, their, their families were all together, which was great. But, you know, I just kind of felt like I didn't really fit in there, you know, even though it was a great church. And then I went to a private college on a scholarship, and it was pretty diverse, but I also found myself, gosh, I don't really belong here. I I remember my freshman year learning like how most of my friends in my dorm listened to the Dave Matthews band. I was like, who is that? I I, I listened to Tupac and Biggie Smalls, like what? And they were like wearing these weird clothes called Abercrombie and Fitch. And I'm like, you you don't go to Old Navy? And then I got a job at Abercrombie because I was like, oh my gosh, how do they afford these clothes, right? That's why I never heard of Abercrombie. And it was interesting. And then my life went on. And even as a pastor, I found myself struggling to fit in, right? I would talk to young pastors who looked really cool and hip and they'd be like, yeah, I went to this Bible college and my dad was a pastor and I'm a pastor. And like, what about you, Rob? And I'm like, oh, that's awesome. Um, my dad's in jail. Um, but yeah, thanks for sharing. And uh, like, I'd never even heard of Bible college growing up. Like, you, you, there's a schools like that? But I say all that to say, I bet for some of you, like even the church, even our church can feel like a place you don't belong. To feel like a place that you don't fit in. Right, like maybe like you look around a room like this and and you look around and I know what you think. Some of you think in your heart, you go, you know what? They look like they have it all together. Let me give you a little secret. They don't. Or, or maybe 
you're here or you're watching and you're going, you know what, I just wonder if these folks have the same struggles and problems that I do. Trust me, they do. Because what happens in the church, what happens even in our church, is it, it just naturally veers into becoming a country club for members only, or at least feeling that way, not you know what I like to call a hospital for the sick, for sinners. And I say that because as we slowly are going through the gospel of Mark, we've been at answering two questions so far. Question number one is, who is Jesus? Who is this guy? And what is this kingdom like that he's bringing with him? And up until this point, actually, Mark has identified Jesus very clearly. He is clearly the Messiah, the son of God, the king, the healer, the teacher, the prophet. We got that. And we also have understood that his kingdom came and it was a kingdom that was calling us to repent, to believe, to know and follow Jesus. Then last week, Adam taught us that Jesus even forgave sin because Jesus was God. But I think a question remains. And the question so far that Mark has not yet answered yet is in this new kingdom, who is invited? Who is the good news for? Is it for religious people only? I mean, so far, Jesus has just been preaching in Jewish synagogues. He's spending most of his time with Jewish people. Did Jesus come just for people who were waiting for the Messiah that were open to spiritual things? And so if you've ever felt like Jesus and his kingdom is not for you, or if you've ever felt in church that you just don't fit in, then man, I have good news for you today. Because Jesus is going to call someone else to be his disciple. And it's really a surprising guy. Someone that none of us would have thought. Look with me. And I'm in Mark chapter 2, started in verse 13. Once again, Jesus went out besides a lake and a large crowd came to him and he began to teach them. And as he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. See, so far, let me stop there. So far in Mark, we've already seen Jesus call Simon, um, his brother Andrew, James and John. Uh, remember, he told them to drop their fishing nets and come and follow him and be his disciples. And, and I think that makes a lot of sense because these guys were commercial fishermen. They were upstanding businessmen in their Jewish community. And even though they were rough around the edges like most fishermen are, um, think Frank Cutter, um, uh, one of our elders, it, it just makes sense <laughs> that Jesus was asked them to come be a follower of his, right? They were hardworking Jewish men, well regarded in the community. But then Jesus calls Levi. And calling Levi would have ruffled the feathers of the religious elite. It would, I, I, I suspect that even some of the disciples were like, ooh, him, really? Uh, because Jesus called a tax collector. Now, if you grew up in church, you've heard this before, but today, you know, we may, we may not despise the IRS, but we're certainly not fans, right? We don't wear, I love the IRS t-shirt or anything like that. And back then it was like that, but even more so, tax collecting in the ancient world was one of the most despised occupations of that time. And there were good reasons for that because they, uh, tax collectors had a bad reputation for being cheaters, for being liars, for being thieves. I mean, think about it. They worked for Rome, the national enemy of the Jews. They were considered traitors by their, by their own people. And so the tax collectors often skinned from the top, so they became very wealthy, but they were despised by most of the people in their small communities. They were treated as kind of like social pariahs. They didn't really fit in with the common folks because they were stealing from them. They didn't fit in with the religious establishment either because they despised them as well. And so very few people would have expected Jesus to call Levi a tax collector to be one of his disciples. So what does this tell us about Jesus? What does this tell us about his kingdom? It tells us that Jesus came to call despised people to himself. 
See, Levi, son of Alphaeus, and I wonder who Alphaeus was and what he was like, his father. We don't know. We don't know anything. But he was just sitting at his tax collector's booth when Jesus said, follow me. It was an invitation to come and be with Jesus, to be a disciple or to be an apprentice. I want you to notice, though, that Jesus didn't say, hey, Levi, clean up your act first and then come follow me. Jesus didn't say, hey, get all your affairs in order and pay the people back that you stole from and then come follow me. He didn't say, hey, Levi, hey, go to Bible college first. And then if you really want to be a pastor, then go get your MDiv at a well-known seminary and, and, and then come follow me. He didn't say, hey, renounce Rome and then come follow me. He simply said, follow me. Come with me, be my disciple, be my apprentice. Come watch me, come be with me, come learn from me. This was, I think, just an irresistible call for a person on the fringes of society, a call from the one who knew Levi, who loved him and welcomed him in. And this, of course, would be an act of faith and courage for Levi. He would have to leave his family if he had one, his job for sure, his possessions, at least for a little while. But on the other side of the coin, I think this was amazing for Levi. Suddenly someone saw him and knew him and loved him and invited him to be with him. And by the way, if you're wondering, this Levi is the same, uh, is also goes by Matthew, who wrote the gospel of Matthew as well, which we studied several years ago. And so Jesus calls this despised and rejected man to be one of his disciples. He starts to shake up these early disciples, but then he does something next that was way outside of the cultural box, way outside of the norm. But he does it to continue to show us who he is and why he came and who's invited in his kingdom. Look with me now at verse 15. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, Many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with sinners and tax collectors, they didn't ask Jesus, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Oh, gross. And on hearing this, so my, in my mind, I, I picture them like at the window looking in, not wanting to participate, but being judgmental, not like any of us. But he said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Wow. And so, you know, what's going on here? You got to know, and uh, like in ancient Palestine, meals were deeply significant. They weren't casual. There was no fast food. You know, there was no Chick-fil-A, even though that's a blessed meal. Um, eating a meal was, was intimate. It was significant. It's how you built relationship. It took a long, long time. And who you ate with was important because meals also define cultural uh, boundaries, Right? So Jews didn't eat with Gentiles and the rich didn't eat with the poor. And so a Jewish rabbi, someone like Jesus, would have never been caught eating with not only tax collectors, but other sinners. Now, when Mark says other sinners, it could be a whole host of different people. It really, doesn't really define it for us. Um, anyone who the Jewish elite felt in, you know, um, um, inferior to them. And, and, and it's funny that it's the Pharisees, these people who are supposed to get it, who they don't question Jesus, they question the disciples. Like, you know how a lot of you guys will like question our volunteers and staff, but you won't come to me? Yeah, kind of like that. Um, no, I'm just kidding, not really. So I think, um, I think Levi is so excited about his newfound faith in Jesus that he, he, he texts all his friends and they all come for this kind of party. I mean, this was a big dinner gathering. It tells me that he had a big house, that he, had, he was wealthy and, and he just invited all his friends to come in. And remember, these would have been friends that were just not your normal folk. I'm guessing maybe some prostitutes, other tax collectors, definitely people that's religious folks would have been like, ew, 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 because that's what they say. And there is Jesus and the disciples eating a meal with these religious and social outcasts. Why? Because he's trying to show us what the kingdom of God is like and who it's for. It's not just for insiders, those of us who get it. It's for outsiders. It's not just for those who think they have it all together. No, it's for the broken, for the lost, the hurting, the sinful. And he's eating with them, sharing a meal, breaking bread, 
listening, loving. It's a powerful moment. New Testament scholar Craig Blomberg puts it this way. He says, some Christians today, so that's us, give the faith a bad reputation because of immoral excesses. But probably a larger number would never have to worry about being so caricatured because they come nowhere close to imitating Jesus' fellowship with disreputable people. I love that. And so it just begs the question, I mean, who would Jesus be eating with today? Who do we think today are disreputable people, both inside the church and outside of the church? Now, assuming that you invite people to your home for dinner, which I hope you do. I would hope you take up Megan's invitation and invite international students to Thanksgiving, but make a good meal, you guys. Don't be cheap about it, okay? Invite them over. And I just always wonder, my wife is so good at this, better than me. Like she loves to have people over to our home and love on them. And I'm always like, I gotta get the house clean though and do everything. She's like, who cares? I'm like, I do. But I thought, gosh, if, if having certain people over to your home is bad for your reputation with church folks, it might be great for the kingdom of God. And on the flip side, if having certain people over to your home is bad for your reputation outside of the church, That too might be good for the kingdom of God because what we see is Jesus came to befriend sinners, to eat with them and to invite anyone and all people into his kingdom. But they gotta know that they're sick. And that's what Jesus tells the Pharisees. He says, hey, the sick need a doctor, right? When you're really, really sick, you don't go to Walgreens and say, do you have anything for this? No, when you're really, really sick, you go to the emergency room, right? And Jesus is saying, likewise, sinners who recognize that they're sinners, who recognize they need forgiveness, man, and healing and restoration. Jesus says, those who I, those are who I came from for, right? I came for those who were sick, who are sick. And so I wondered, I was just thinking this week, what would it look like Hi, sir, come on up. We got a front row just for you. I wondered, that it's wide open, man. It's wide open. I wondered this week, as I thought about my ministry in my own life, like, if I truly had a ministry like Jesus, I might get fired, right? I mean, think about it. I mean, I know I'm being silly here, but like, what if you were out one night and you saw me eating with several prostitutes in the Tenderloin District? late at night. You'd probably text someone, or at least please do that if you see that, okay? Or what if my ministry was spent with just 12 men only? Or what if the majority of our churchy religious establishment despised me and spoke out against me? What if I never stayed in one place very long? What if I was single and broke, right? What if I hung around people that just kind of gave you the heebie-jeebies? Or what if my sermons can actually confuse people or angered people enough that they wanted to kill me, right? That's kind of like the ministry of Jesus. And so you may be wondering and thinking, well, gosh, what is it with all these like religious people in the New Testament, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, John disciples, like why don't they just get it? I mean, Jesus was there. I mean, we get it. But just to be fair to them, they cared about following God too. They cared deeply. But the Pharisees started to do that through obedience to rules, to obedience to their traditions. And the deeply pious Jews believed that it was actually their duty to stay away from people that would contaminate them. And so Jesus came and his mission was to preach the kingdom of God to sick and needy people. That that meant being with them, eating with them, living among them. It meant getting his hands dirty in people's lives. And see, the Pharisees cared, like so many of us do sometimes care about getting people to look and act a certain way and be clean. And Jesus said, I came for something different, something on the inside of your heart. See, the Pharisees, like me, like us, like so many of our churches, had a deeper problem. And their deeper problem was they had very little compassion for people far from God. The Pharisees had forgot about their, uh, the, the, the Jewish mission of being a beacon of light and hope for all people because of their witness but they stray from their original purpose as the shepherds of Israel. And here's the deal. If we are not careful as Christians and as churches, it's an easy trap to fall into for us too. 
I heard this years ago. I think it's true, but it may not be true, but I think it's true because it was, it was a rumor that went around for a long time. Um, Tony Campolo, who's now with the Lord, um, he was a pioneer of urban ministry. He was a professor at a Bible college on the East Coast. And, and I remember hearing this, and I'm like, that can't be true, but I think it is. Um, it's been said that he was preaching to a group of people, I forget what the conference was, and he made this statement. He said, I have three things I wanna tell you today. First, while you were sleeping last night, 30,000 kids died of starvation or diseases related to malnutrition. And second, most of you don't give a S-H-I-T. And he said it. And what's worse, he says, is you're more upset that I said S-H-I-T than the fact that 30,000 kids died last night. Ouch, right? See, our problem can be our pharisaical heart. And that's just the natural tendency of Christians and churches to start thinking about ourselves only, not those sick people outside of, this, of these walls. It's just like my car that just has a way of going out of alignment, right? I don't do anything different. It just naturally goes out of alignment. And Christians and churches too, we naturally go into legalism and self-righteousness and self-preservation. And, and just think about your own life. Right? We do this. We wake up on Sundays and go, ah, should I go to church or not? I mean, what's in it for me? Is Rob preaching or not? I don't know. I'm going to stay home in my cozies and just maybe watch it online. Or if you're checking out churches, the worship better be good. The sermon better be amazing. If not, we'll just go somewhere else. Am I comfortable here? Do people look like me? Do they act like me? Now, None of those questions are necessarily wrong. I hope the worship is great. I hope the sermons are great. There's always next Sunday if they're not. But the church exists not only for us, but for those who don't know Jesus yet. And our mission, the reason why we exist and the mandate God has given us is go into all the world preaching the gospel right? And making disciples. That is why this month we are celebrating giving space for both our local and global outreach partners and missionaries. Because that's why we're, I mean, just think about it like this. The moment you came to faith, why didn't God just like take you off the planet? Good. I got him. Let's get out of here. Why? Because he has a mission for you too. And it's not just to make a lot of money and retire and play golf until, until you die. I mean, that sounds great, but God wants to use you. And that's why people were drawn to Jesus, man, because he loved them. He welcomed them in. He ate with them. He was their friend. He neither condoned their sinful behavior, but he also didn't have strings attached to his relationship with them. He loved people for where they were at, people created in the image of God. And so Jesus came to call despised people to himself. Jesus came to befriend sinners and eat with them. But I want to show show you one more reason why Jesus came, at least in our text this morning. Let me look, start in verse 18, because now the religious folks are really starting to get on Jesus' case. And we'll see next week, they're really going to get on his case. It says, now John's disciples, that's John's the Baptist, and the Pharisees were fasting. Fasting is a good thing. But some people came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours aren't? And Jesus answered in a very um, parable type of way. He says, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and oh, and on that day they will fast. And then he says, no one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins. And both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. And so it's interesting, now the Pharisees and John the Baptist's disciples are kind of coming together, and now they're not asking the disciples a question. Now they come straight to Jesus, and they want to get religious on Jesus and say, hey, let's talk about fasting. 
And back then, Pharisees, um, they fasted about twice a week, if I'm right, in accordance to Jewish tradition. And so they're deeply bothered that the disciples aren't fasting like them too. But Jesus says with the arrival of, of his kingdom, Jesus says that something is new here. There is a new era that is dawning. There is a new kingdom. And Jesus said, it's not a time to mourn. Oh, you're going to mourn when I go to the cross. But now is a time to celebrate. Yes, you will mourn. Yes, you will fast. But man, when I'm beaten and crucified, but right now it's a time of joyful celebration. And so to illustrate his point, he gives three little kind of short parables of what the kingdom of God is like. Jesus, his kingdom is like a bridegroom, a new patch and new wine. Let me quickly go through those. He says the kingdom of God is like a bridegroom on his wedding day. And he just asks a very simple question that would be true for us today. Hey, when you go to a wedding, do you fast? No, unless they're super cheap and don't have any food, right? That'd be terrible, right? No, when you go to a wedding, man, you go to show up, to have a good time, to eat, to have a few drinks, right? Because at a wedding, you're celebrating something new. You're celebrating really a miracle, two people becoming one flesh, a new union. We celebrate at weddings. And then he says, secondly, the kingdom of God is also like a new patch. And thirdly, it's like new wine. And just real quick, I don't know this because I'm not a seamstress and I don't even know how to sew anything. But he he says, come on, you guys get this, right? You don't put a new patch onto an old garment because it's going to break away from that. It's going to tear the patch. It's going to tear the garment. He says, and duh, you don't put new wine into an old wineskin. So back then you could store wine in jars. You can store wine in um, wineskins that I think were made of like sheep um, skin. And, but what happens is when you pour wine in, new wine into uh, uh, to a skin, it, 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 it's going to expand. It's going to expand. And so those old wineskins are done expanding. So if you put new wine into an old wineskin, it's going to burst. And Jesus says, hey, you're going to ruin the wine, not alone the wineskin. And so what is Jesus saying here? What is he doing here? He's saying, hey, Jesus is the bridegroom who's ushering us into this marriage, this new era, the kingdom of God. It is a time to celebrate. And Jesus um, wants to not just patch up your life with some spiritual things. No, 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 no. Jesus, and, and Jesus, you actually put on an entire new set of clothes. God's righteousness himself is given to you that you put on. And Jesus is also like new wine that he he and his kingdom, they don't fit into the old containers of religion, right? And remember, he's talking to Pharisees and to John's disciples. He says, he's saying, unlike the old ways of being right with God, animal sacrifices and worship at the temple and good works and covenantal faithfulness in light of Jesus and his kingdom, they no longer have any authority to save sinners, Jesus alone has the authority to save people and bring his people into the kingdom of God. We're not saved by the blood of animals, but the blood of Jesus. And so what Mark is highlighting for us is that God has done something new in Jesus, something new in his kingdom. And actually next week, we're going to see Jesus continuing to confront the old ways. And we're going to talk about the Sabbath next week. And so let me end with sharing a, a great story because um, uh, since I'm picking on Tony Campolis, keep, keep picking on him. And this was, an, again, I heard this throughout um, my uh, Christian life and, 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 and this is very true. It actually, he writes about it in his book, The Kingdom of God is a Party. Isn't that a great? I should have titled my sermon that. The Kingdom of God is a Party. And he talks about that he was late one night in uh, the city of Honolulu. um, And I think he went to a prayer meeting or to a conference and he just couldn't sleep one night. And so he goes out um, to find a cup of coffee late at night and he's in downtown Honolulu. And it was like 3.30 in the morning and he finds this little greasy kind of spoon type of place and he gets a cup of coffee. And as he's sipping his coffee... Um, women walk in who are clearly prostitutes. I mean, you know, hardly any clothes on, talking about different things. And he's like, wow, wow, this is, this is going to get me in trouble. 
and he's drinking his coffee and he overhears one of them who he'll later know as Agnes talk about, hey girls, she's like, tomorrow's gonna be my, tomorrow's my birthday. What are you guys doing to celebrate? And they're like, shut up, girl, we ain't celebrating you. And you know, we got work to do or whatever, right? And he overhears all this and then they leave and Tony gets this idea and he goes up to the owner and he says, hey, are, do those women always come in at this time? He goes, oh yeah, they're here every night, 3.30, right? And he goes, oh, um, and, and he came with this idea. He said, how would you feel if, I came in a little early and I decorated the place and, um, and we threw Agnes a birthday party. And he was like, seriously? He's like, do you want anything from her? He's like, oh, no, no, I don't want, you know, I just want to throw her a birthday party. And the wife hears about it and says, oh, that's great. Um, I'll make her a cake. And they're like, okay. So the next night he, he gets in there at 2.30 a.m. and they decorate the place and there's this little cake that uh, the, 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 the woman made and all of a sudden, I guess word got out because all of a sudden this little greasy spoon diner was packed with prostitutes. And, and Agnes comes in and they go, surprise, happy birthday. And she just starts bawling, right? So blown away. And, she, and they give her the cake. And he writes that she was so overwhelmed with a cake that she says, uh, is it okay if we don't eat the cake? I, I, I want to take it home and save it. And they're all like, oh, Okay. So she says, I'll be back, but I just want to run home. I live right down the street. I'm going to put it in my fridge and I'm going to come back. And she leaves with the cake and they're all kind of like stunned, like, oh, this got awkward. And then Tony says, uh, oh, hey girls, how about I pray? <laughs> and listen to what he writes. He says, looking back on it now, it seems more than strange for a sociologist to be leading a prayer meeting with a bunch of prostitutes in a diner in Honolulu at 3.30 in the morning. But then it just felt like the right thing to do. So I prayed for Agnes. I prayed for her salvation. I prayed that her life would be changed and that God would be good to her. And when I finished, Harry, that's the diner owner, he leaned over the counter with a trace of hostility in his voice said, hey, you never told me you were a preacher. What kind of church do you belong to? And he says this in one of those moments when just the right words came to me. And he said, I belong to a church that throws birthday parties for whores at 3.30 in the morning. <laughs> and Harry waited a moment and he said, no, you don't. There's no church like that. If there was, I'd join it. I'd join a church like that. And then Dr. Tony Campolo says, wouldn't we all? Wouldn't we all like to join a church that throws birthday parties for whores at 3.30 in the morning? Well, he writes, that's the kind of church that Jesus came to create. Jesus came to usher in a new kingdom for those in need, a kingdom for any and all people who are sick and in need of Jesus, a kingdom for you and a kingdom for those out there. Let's pray together, church. And Father, as we prepare our hearts for communion and the Lord's Supper. We are reminded that this table is for everyone who have placed their faith in Jesus. For those of us who have it all together and for those of us who don't think they have it all together, thank you that your kingdom is wide enough and deep enough and loving enough for people like me, people like Viola Davis, and people like Agnes. We're so grateful, God, that you invited us to come and to celebrate with you. There is a new kingdom that's here, and we cannot wait, Jesus, for your kingdom to come. In the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit, we pray. Amen. And so if you have your communion cups, go ahead and take those out. Now, if you don't have one, just go ahead and raise your hands and the ushers will come get you one. There's a few up here. Um, here, Steve Barney. There you go, right there. <laughs> Is that like unholy? That's probably unholy, I know. It feels that way. I just threw the blood. I'm sorry, my Catholic friends.
But the night was Jesus was betrayed, he gave thanks to God the Father. He broke the bread and he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. Let's eat together, church. And then he took the cup and he gave thanks to God the Father for the cup. And he said, this is a cup of the new covenant in my blood. Take and drink. And let's stand together and let's worship King Jesus.